Welcome to the Holiness Today podcast. I'm Stan Reeder, Regional Director of USA Canada, and we are partnering with Holiness Today to feature preachers from across the region. We hope these messages will encourage your daily walk with the Lord and help you feel connected with our region. And I've been looking at Luke chapter 24 this week. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of the passage to you. And then I'm going to summarize the story a little bit. And then I'm going to read to you the section of this story that I really want us to zero in on. But I also want you to hear this. This is a really, I think, important part of this series that we've been in for weeks and months. That we're calling the story. From Genesis to Revelation... The piece that we're going to talk about today, I would say, is the centerpiece of the entire story. And so I want you just to open your hearts and open your ears, that even you might hear this story in a fresh way today, and that God would connect it to your hearts. Luke 24, 1 through 7 says this, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Now, on that same day, there's two of them that are walking down the road to Emmaus. Some of you might remember that story as well here in Luke 24. It was a seven-mile journey. They're walking along with each other, and suddenly, Scripture tells us that Jesus appears alongside of them and walks with them. Scripture tells us that they are kept from recognizing him. And so he says to them, he says, in a sense, good day, what are you guys talking about? And they responded with, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. And they sentenced him to death and crucified him. We had hopes that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And then get this, it's the third day since all this happened. And some women are sharing that they went to the tomb today. And he was not there. Some angels spoke to them and said he's alive. And others have confirmed that what they have shared is real. Then Jesus said to them, Why are you so slow to believe? I mean, all this has been spoken about. They invited Jesus to stay with them, and later that evening, while breaking bread, their eyes opened so that they could recognize him. And then he vanished. They then returned to Jerusalem to share what they'd experienced. While they're sharing, Jesus appears again. They were frightened, but he says to them, Peace be with you. He then opens their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And then he says these significant words to them. And here's where we're going to focus today. Luke 24, 46 through 49. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. The centerpiece of the story is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. If you look at verse 46, he told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. I want us to not overlook Jesus' death. I mean, it's such a significant piece of this story. I think too often we move on ahead of the death piece 
Because honestly, the death is just kind of hard to look at. It's hard to talk about. It's not, it's not a fun subject to think about death or to think about suffering or even to think about crucifixion. It's not dinner table conversation. A couple of weeks ago, I heard someone say, well, we're all headed there, right? We're all headed towards death anyway. It was not a real positive conversation. And, but there's some truth to it. I actually started thinking about even the fam, my family as I know it, Rachel and I and my two kids, right? 22 and 20. And I was thinking about how, like, right now it seems so real. All I can think about is the life that we live. But if you fast forward 70 or 80 years, none of us will be here. Like, we'll, we'll be gone. Fast forward 80 years, most of you will not be here. Like it'll be a whole new group sitting here in college church. I was thinking you fast forward 100 or 200 years down the road, some eighth grader will be doing a family tree project and that's where I'll be, on the family tree, right? It's just, it's weird to think about. But I also think this, I, I think as hard as death is for us to wrap our heads around, we need to. Death is so final. When I was a senior in high school, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I was trying on all kinds of things. I was actually, it was a guidance counselor that I knew really well. And so I would go by their office and I would talk to them. And I was just trying to figure out like, man, like what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I found it actually really overwhelming. There were several things that came to mind. And one of those was the idea of being a funeral director. Can you picture that? You're like, no, I can't, right? So I, I actually, I called up our local funeral director in a small town, you, you know them. Like they're just known, it's just part of the community. I called him up, I set up a meeting and I went in and I sat down with him and I said, hey, tell me what it's like to be a funeral director. And he began to describe things to me and I was kind of listening. What attracted me to the idea of being a funeral director was walking with people in their hardest days. That I would always kind of be at that place where people were grieving and hurting and I'd get to walk with him. The only thing I didn't like as he was talking was this idea that he said, I very, very rarely get to go on vacation. I didn't think that sounded very pleasant. But then he said this to me. He said, Kevin, if you really want to like learn more, the next time I get a customer, I'll call you. Sure enough, I go home. A week or two later, he calls. He said, hey, if you want to come in, come on in. So I drive to the funeral home and I walk in. He sits me down in a room and he kind of prepares me. It was not enough preparation, but he prepared me. And then we opened the door and went in this room and the customer was there. And I, I just stared. I was very overwhelmed in the moment. And then he began to describe the process and all the things he did. Honestly, I don't remember any of that because I was just staring. I knew within about 20 seconds of being in the room that I was not gonna be a funeral director. I mean, I didn't know it would end up being a great you know, sermon illustration years later, but I thought, I'm not doing this. And then the Lord kind of had a sense of humor. He called me to be a pastor, which means I still get to walk with people in their hardest moments, but I don't have to go in that room. That, that room, Man, it, it helped me to see the finality of death. As a pastor, I've seen it many, many times. I've seen it in my own life many times. I will tell you this, every time I sit at a funeral, every time I lead a funeral, there is not a funeral that I'm not a part of that I still don't grieve the loss of my loved ones. It's the place where I'm reminded of the finality of life. See, I recognize that this story, <clears throat> even when we read it here, it only really lingers in, in this death moment for three days. I even think about Good Friday and Easter. I mean, most of us, Good Friday, we just try to get through it. And then we're like, yeah, the party's on, resurrection. We like to live into that. Who wants to hang out at the death piece of the story? But the only way only way to, I mean, we, we need to, we need to see. Jesus didn't go to sleep. Jesus wasn't partially dead. 
Jesus died. He actually died. And the only way we see the power of the resurrection is if we see the finality of Jesus' death. So how does the death change the way we live? I'm glad you asked. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And listen to verse 47. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. <clears throat> you have the opportunity to repent. As we talked about Jesus last week, he had all the power from above, but he chose not to use it. He willingly walked toward death, crucifixion, humiliating kind of death, as he loved us to the very end of his life. Even you can see the struggle in Luke 22. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. When I think about repentance, oftentimes repentance around the church, everybody kind of clams up just a little bit when, when the pastor starts talking about repentance. Because this is the type of message that one might say, okay, like I, this, this might be the step on your toes kind of message. This is the one that's gonna make me feel guilty or this is the one I don't really care to hear. But I want you to hear this. That in repentance, like the opportunity to turn from our way and follow God's way, it is full of grace. It is a very gracious thing that God would say, I'm actually gonna give you the opportunity to repent. See, sin is always rooted in our selfishness. And repentance is the opportunity to turn towards God and away from ourselves and away from our selfish desires and to begin to move towards his way and his desires. <clears throat> Sorry. There were so many times as a teenager when I look back at my teenage days before I really knew Jesus, my parents were always working against me. Some of you teenagers, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but I'm guessing some of you feel this way. I had things I wanted to do. I had fun that I wanted to participate in. I had so much stuff that I was like, looked at and I was like, oh yeah, I wanna do that. I was always planning and scheming to do and to live what I thought was my best life. And my parents were always strategically planning and scheming to prevent me from living my best life. Anybody over here? They're like, yeah, parents, anybody? We get that, right? We understand it. They were always raining on my parade. And then later in life, much later in life, I realized how much they loved me. In fact, when I became a parent, I realized how much they loved me. That they wanted their absolute, like God's absolute best for me. And I would say the same for my children. I want God's absolute best for them. And sometimes, from my point of view, they just can't see it. So they're scheming and planning to do their thing, and I'm scheming and planning to undo their thing, right? To run roadblocks. And I'm sure at times they think I'm working against them. But so many times I just wish they could see it, looking back, even at their earlier years. Like I wanted them to see it. Because there's serious consequences on the other side of living our way adhering to our selfish desires versus God's. Sin always leads to death, not to life. And I want you to hear this too. Sin is it's a very personal subject. So even as I talk about it, I mean, there's, there's pieces of us that are like, mm, it's personal, Kevin. This is personal. Like, you're in my business. But I want you to hear this too. Yes, it is personal because there's real consequences for us. But the consequences of sin are not only personal, they affect everyone around you. you you've probably seen it. That at times we think sin is only gonna affect me. This is between me and the Lord, Kevin. Maybe. But sometimes those consequences not only affect you, they affect your family. They affect everyone around you. They affect your friends, your kids. But I want you to hear that repentance is rooted in this idea 
that God is so good and he loves his children so much that he wants the best for us. And so his overcoming death gives us the opportunity to turn towards him and to trust that his best, to live into it. In fact, I would say this, at the intersections with sin, his spirit, this is how it works, his spirit makes us aware. We all know this. There's times when you're walking towards something, you're walking towards a decision, you're just living life, and the Holy Spirit makes you aware that you're headed the wrong direction. Now, at times you could say, oh yeah, it's raining on my parade, right? Or you could say, he's trying to prevent me from a mess. He's trying to stop me from incurring these consequences that are not good for me. And so the opportunity is by his grace to say, hey, 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 stop. Don't go any further. Do not move beyond this line. My opportunity for you is to turn around and begin headed in the other direction, which has goodness for you, which has my best for you. If only you could see what I see. And here's where I want us to pause in the room, as well as for those online. Wherever you are located today, this might be the most important thing I say. Wherever you are located today, I recognize in a room, when I'm talking to this many people this morning, first service, second service, those online, there are people today who are contemplating decisions that will wreck your life that will bring about consequences that you have no idea of, that have potential to wreck your family's life. I can't see it. I'm not, I don't have anyone in mind, but I know, statistically speaking, in a room this size, there are people who are contemplating decisions of sin that will wreck you. And today, maybe today is a moment of grace for you. You showed up at the right place at the right time where the Holy Spirit could slip in beside you and say, I love you so much, I brought you to church today. That you could hear this message and I could turn you around. That you wouldn't have to discover all this bad in front of you, but you could discover my best. It is my grace today that you are hearing and all you have to do is turn from it and move towards me. You can be forgiven. Some of us, that's really hard to believe, but you can. It doesn't matter how much of sin is in your past. It doesn't matter how high it's piled up. It doesn't matter the stories that are behind you. You can be forgiven. Last week, we talked about when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Jesus made a statement that I want to revisit. He said, you shall never wash my feet. That's what Peter said. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. We talked about there was double meaning in that. Unless I wash your feet, you're not coming to the table to eat. But unless you receive the washing that I have provided, the washing of your sins, which comes through the cross, you will not have relationship with me. If Jesus doesn't die and face the power of death, it continues to rule the day. His death and overcoming it gives us the potential to overcome it as well. The gap that once was there is overcome with a path made to a real relationship with God. Acts 3 puts it this way. But this is how God fulfilled what he'd foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And I love Proverbs 28, which I discovered this week. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Sin always tempts us to cover it. Go all the way back to the beginning. Hiding with leaves. Sin always tempts us to cover it. The invitation is to say, I can reveal it because my sin is not too great for what took place on the cross. That what Jesus did can account for everything and it can be wiped away in times of refreshing may come and I can confess and turn towards him. And what do we receive? His overwhelming mercy. 
their opportunity is to see that death is a part of this story. It's a part of our story as well. I want you even to think beyond physical death. I mean, every time we come to the intersection of my way versus his way, we have the opportunity to do what Jesus did. Not my will, but your will. Every time he gives us that opportunity to die to what we want and what we desire. To die to the idea that I think I know what is best and to live into that God loves me so much that he prevents me from all of the disaster that comes with that kind of decision and he points me in a different direction. It's beautiful. It's the gospel. Even the power to choose. I mean, think about it. We have a power to choose by his grace. The power to choose Jesus and the power is the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And this kind of power, it's unheard of. It was unheard of before this. It's unheard of after this. The kind of power that lifted Jesus from the grave, like this, can I tell you something? If this kind of power, if, there was, if it happened any other time, you would know it. You would hear about it. It would be on the news. It would be told over and over. I was thinking about it this way. Can you imagine after someone's passing, someone passes away, they're at the funeral home. Three days later, the funeral director walks in the back room and goes, they're not here. Makes the phone call to family. Hey, they're not here. You'd know that, wouldn't you? That story would be told over and over and over. This power is unique. It's amazing. And it's real. And not only is it power in this story, what the Bible tells us is the same power that's available in this story is available in our story. Ephesians 1 puts it this way. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. What does this mean for us? It means it makes a difference. This kind of power makes a difference in how we live. That we have the power to choose Jesus. That we're not powerless to our choices. We have the power to overcome sin that leads us to death. And the power of the resurrection I mean, it comes from God himself who takes residence in us, his spirit who lives in our hearts. The whole opportunity here, the big opportunity is to cooperate with his spirit who lives within you. We call this the surrendered life or the sanctified life that we could come to the point where we decide that what we want is to live God's way empowered by him, less driven by our own desires and more driven by his. See, the power of the resurrection makes a difference in our living, but it also makes a difference in our dying. I mean, the resurrection for all those who believe in Jesus will be realized when Christ raises us out of our graves and transforms us into new beings. That's what scripture says. But the hope is bigger than just this personal kind of hope. The death and the resurrection, not only is it for you, the death and resurrection defeats all the powers that oppose God. Think about that for a minute. Let it just resonate in your mind. All the powers that oppose God have been overcome. I mean, the disciples, from a human perspective, they were experiencing hardship and loss, and it seemed like the enemy was winning. But Jesus is reminding them that there's something greater at work than what they can see in front of them. I was thinking about this. We should be the most hopeful people on the planet. We should be the most optimistic people. We should be like living and leading people in a way in which we're not just doom and gloom because the world is on the way down. We know how the story ends. I mean, confession, it's much easier to be doom and gloom. 
We hear the messages everywhere. Just flip on the news. Watch it for an hour and see how you feel afterwards. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch the news, but I'm saying which story are we living into? Are we, are we living into the story that the narrative that the world wants to give us? Are we living into the narrative that we read here in Luke 24? The invitation is that his story becomes our story. I love verse 48 that says, you are witnesses of these things. He's saying, you've seen it. He died and was resurrected. When I hear the word witness, the first thing that comes to mind for me, even when I'm growing up, was that we run around and we tell people about Jesus. That witness is about verbal communication. I think that can be part of it. But the term martyr comes from the Greek word witness. See, many who were part of the early church, they witnessed with their words, but they also witnessed by literally giving their life. That their life, in, in the midst of giving it, pointed to their belief, full belief in following of Jesus. The path of following Jesus. Maybe some of you have just started that relationship. Maybe some of you haven't, it hasn't been happening that long and you're just kind of just learning what it means to follow Jesus. And I want to tell you, this is what it is. It's living each and every day, choosing to align your life with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That every day you're inviting him to say, okay, I'm willing to listen to you. I mean, all you got to do is show me. And my commitment is going to be to live in a way in which I die to my own desires. That I'm holding my future really loose and I'm hanging on to the future that you have for me. And that when you show me, I'm thankful that you'll also give me the same power that lifted you out of the grave. The same power is available to me that I can turn away from the life that will lead me to death and I can turn towards life to the full. What a beautiful gift. I'm going to ask our choir to come, and they're going to come, and they're going to sing one more song, but as they prepare to come, would you just bow your heads with me? I want to lead us in a time of prayer today. Maybe you're here today, and you, you know in your heart you don't really have a relationship with Jesus. You heard Pastor John say it earlier, our mission is to lead you into that. And even today, you can start a brand new life with Jesus. Maybe today is the day in which you know the Holy Spirit has said to you, we gotta get this turned around. And by grace, you have an opportunity to do so. You have the power to choose and to turn towards him. So if that's you, I'm gonna pray a prayer and I want you to pray it with me and I'm actually gonna have it on the screens. It's not a magic prayer, but I think if you'll pray these words and you'll mean them in your heart, they align with what scripture tells us about what following Jesus looks like. So if that's you, pray this with me, Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, that he gave his life for the forgiveness of my sins and was raised from the grave to give me life. I turn from my ways. By your grace, I turn from my ways and I choose yours. I receive your grace, this gift that you're giving me by faith. Come into my life. I will follow you. I want to tell you, scripture makes it very clear. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, in Jesus, and that he was crucified and raised on your behalf, that you will be saved. That what he did on the cross is big enough for your sins. And you can start fresh and new with him today. And then maybe there's folks here in this room today who would say, Kevin, I'm at a crossroads too. I have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm at a crossroads. And I'm facing some things that I can see it. The spirit is making me aware 
I need to get, I need to get this turned around. I'm definitely walking in my own ways, not his. It's an invitation. It's a gracious invitation to say, God, I want to surrender my direction to you. I want to surrender my life to you. I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about you. I don't want to lead this. I want you to lead this. And here's what I promise you, that when you come to that place and you pray that prayer, he can give you the same power that lifted Jesus out of the grave to help you to make the decisions that you need to make. To actually live the life that he's called you to live. You can't do it on your own. You need power from within. So Father, I pray for those folks today too, and I pray, God, I trust that your spirit is right here in this room and you're communicating to us. Would we trust that the same power that was visible in this story is available for us today? But Lord, you invite us to come to the end of our own power. To just lay down everything and say, I get it. I can't do this. God, I give you my life. I surrender today in hopes and faith and trust that you can empower me to live in a way that looks more like you. You can change my desires. You can change my heart. You can make me new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Holiness Today podcast. If you enjoyed this production and wish to hear more, visit holinesstoday.org slash podcast or find us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.